conceptual perspectives people talk Real about talk, it, it throwing shots. all of the elements. <laughs> Hello everybody, Dr. Rick Wallace here, dropping in with a little special announcement for those who have followed me for any stretch of time. You know, outside of the businesses that I run, like Myriad Business Solutions, the Visionetics Institute, Odyssey Media Group, I also do a great deal of work inside of the inner city communities uh, in Houston, Dallas, and other areas. Uh, I'm asking now as we push a fundraiser that you support what the Odyssey Project is doing in the inner cities, uh, especially with programs like Black Men Lead, which is a rite of passage uh, initiative, and Restoring Ghetto for, Ghetto's Forgotten Daughters, which is a program focused on helping young girls, but boys as well, suffering from childhood sexual abuse, uh, rape, molestation, domestic abuse, uh, absentee fatherhood, and so many other things. Uh, the information will be in the box. Thank you. dropping in on you hope everybody's having an unbelievable day it's been crazy uh, I, this is my first day back full time in two weeks uh so obviously a lot's going on uh, I'm, I'm grateful i've got a lot done uh but i want to talk to you um about something that i think we need to have more uh prevalent and consistent cons uh, conversations about there's so much in the black community that we need to be addressing and I want to have this conversation with you. Uh, again, we're in the middle of a fundraiser. I can't stress that enough. Uh, it's sort of tied into so many different things, but we need your support. The work we do and the services we provide are so necessary and they're underfunded and we are underserving because they're underfunded. And yet we have all of these assessments of where we are as, are as a people when we don't operate in a way that changes that. So again, if you believe in what we're doing, if you if you are a consistent subscriber on this channel, we need your support. We need you to go to the description box, click the link and support and give to the Odyssey Project, the Black Man Lead, the work we do in the community for domestic abuse, domestic uh, intimate partner violence, addiction, mental health. All these things are things we provide services for. But there's so much of a larger need, a, a huge gap. People are falling through the, these aren't even cracks. They're caverns that people are falling through because we simply don't have the means. And there are other groups out there too that just simply are not getting the support. It's all the big name groups that really don't do anything but take, um, do photo ops and, and all this stuff. The PR is unbelievable, but the services suck and it shows in the performance of the black community. It's time for us to stand up and actually start doing something. And we're gonna have to do it on our own. We can't expect funding from the government. We can't expect funding from big business. They don't benefit from us winning. And as long as we don't understand that, we're gonna consistently uh, step on our own feet, trying to get out of this cavern uh, of a hole we find ourselves in. And the thing is, we're capable, but we're gonna have to change our thinking. I'm here to address a question, uh, so, sort of along, along the lines of this. I was sitting up and I was having a conversation earlier today, and it was along the lines of business and entrepreneurship and wealth building and things of that nature. It's Money Monday, so you know normally I have conversations with other people that I admire and what they're doing to get insight, to ask questions, uh, to share my thoughts, and you know iron sharpens iron. Um, and the person I was talking to asked me, why is it that we are consistently at the bottom of the socioeconomic ladder, on the bottom rung of the socioeconomic ladder, consistently year in and year out? Uh, why is it that the racial wealth gap is widening instead of narrowing? 
with all of the education we have, with all of these different mechanisms like the internet and so many different other ways that we can generate revenue, why are we still in last place? And uh, I thought about it for a while and there are so many different components at play, so many different mechanisms at play, so many different ways that we are driven by propaganda to um, move in ways that are detrimental to our own uh, desires, our val detrimental to the development of effective and productive values, interests, and principles that serve us and our progeny uh, down in lineage down the line. But where we have to start is in the consumer mindset, in the mindset that we represent wealth by spending. Uh, it is an illusion and a lie that's pushed often. Uh, when you live in a debt-based economy, that means the economy is literally driven by people going in debt to buy the things they want or you know need. And that debt is then literally negotiated, uh, sold, held as collateral against the value of the dollar because the, value, the dollar isn't underwritten by gold. It doesn't have a standard. The standard that drives the American economy and since uh, the U.S. dollar is a universal uh, promissory note, uh, a lot of global, global economies, it's underwritten by debt. So we have to consistently convince people to spend. That's why you're always hearing about the Federal Reserve dropping interest rates and all that stuff because the sound of that makes people think, okay, now's a good time to go get something on credit. Well, the whole thing is we need you to buy, but we also need you to buy on credit. We need you to buy more than what you're capable of buying in in, in liquid assets or in, in, in cash. And so that's one of the things that we are. We are consumer-minded. We're consumer-driven. We also have a very poor relationship with money. Um, and it's not always been that way. We can't say that this is 100% a, re, a, 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 a result of slavery. This is a result of not protect, protecting our interests. Uh, it, it is definitely a result of integration and the need and the feeling of being accepted and wanted and allowed to be in spaces that we weren't allowed to be in and accepted in versus building our own. What it gave was a mentality, and we don't understand this on a psychological level, but the relationship we have with money is highly psychological, and we have to understand that. So here's the thing. When we sit up and say we own our own cab companies, we own our own movie theaters, we own our own bus companies, we own our own cleaners, we own all the things we need to be self-sufficient among ourselves and to really truly build and grow our own, but for some reason there's this need to patronize businesses that don't want our service, that doesn't, they don't want our dollar. And we literally forced a sector of this country to take money from us. And we never saw it that way. We saw it as being accepted. We, and the thing is, what you have to learn is the mindset, the mindset that drives hatred, the mindset that drives difference is never going to be legislated. You can legislate behavior to a certain extent, but you can't legislate thinking. Thinking is what produced it. How we're viewed is what's produced it. And the thing is, in order to demand so heavily that we abandon what we have to be a part of something we're not wanted in, says subconsciously that they have something better. Or as we tend to say it, the white man's ice is colder. The problem with that is the moment that you set your mind to moving in that direction, now your mind is not designed to do what's best for you, what's, what's, what's best for them. You see spending money with them as something better than owning your own. You see being accepted by them as something better than building your own. So what you think is, if I can look like them, if I can talk like them, if I can drive what they drive, if I can wear the things that they say are nice, then they'll see me differently because I'm not wearing those rags. I'm not, and it's the idea of how they view us. They view us as less than. And the bottom line is, whether you're talking about a race or you're talking about an individual, the first person who has to believe in you is you, not someone else. 
You have to know who you are. Suffering from an identity crisis is never going to be the best place from which you can build a positive financial structure. Why? Because the people who have the message that drives what you want to buy are never going to remind you of who you are. So what's going to happen is they're going to support messaging that says, if you get this, you're great. If you get this, you're successful. So what we have done is we bought into an idea of symbolic success that I have the things that successful people have, so I'm successful. And success isn't driven by symbols. Embo you know, uh, embolism or, or having a, 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 a emblemism or having an emblem of something is simply something that is a reminder of something that has to be real. The emblem without the reality is only empty symbolism. What you have to have is the emblem and the reality. You have to have something that says, hey, and the emblem doesn't have to be the shiny thing. We are constantly chasing the shiny thing. We are constantly chasing the cars. It's, it's amazing to me that they have 10 times the median household wealth as we do, and we buy twice as many as Mercedes as they do because they, they've told us that that's success. But when you look at the top 20 cars that are driven by millionaires, the only one that falls within the luxury category in the top 10 is a Lexus. The BMW is in, I think, like 13 or something like that, and the Mercedes is like 17. The number one car driven by millionaires is a Toyota Camry. Now, first of all, we don't have the right relationship with money to understand that because in our mindset, a millionaire is somebody with a million dollars in their bank account. And rarely are seven-figure millionaires sitting around with a million dollars in their bank account. Their millionaire status is the result of the accumulation of assets preferably hard assets or at least medium assets where it's not easily uh, uh, lost or exposed to uh, currency, uh, currency rate volat volatility. And what I mean by that is nobody who understands money is sitting around with a bunch of cash right now. Why? Because the value of cash is trash. And it's, and it's constantly degrading. The old idea of hiding mattress, money under the mattress or putting ma money back is not a great idea because that money isn't worth what it was 50 years ago, 40 years ago, 20 years ago. And you are constantly losing wealth by having it sit there. What do you want to do? You want to invest it in assets that hold value, real estate, precious metals, arts, collect any, any type of valuable collections that can be insured. Uh, it's an asset if it can be used as collateral and it can be insured. If it can't be used as collateral and be insured, then you are probably not dealing with the asset and in some kind of way you just spent, some, spent money on something. You want to have a heavy asset. When you look at millionaires who have less than $10 million, hard to find one with a million dollars plus just sitting around in a bank account because they're smart enough to understand not a good that's a fast way to lose a million dollars to be totally honest especially right about now what they are doing is investing in things using insurance as a leverage asset to grow grow wealth uh, there's a number of different ways that's done if you don't understand it you need to be understanding it you need to get over and check out my my, my, my videos on uh, money Monday and wealth building Wednesday. But I want to talk about mindset within the collective here. I want to talk about the fact that we are spending money on symbols. We don't understand how things work. And how many times have you heard me say that we get taken advantage of because we don't understand how things work? We have this idea of what it's supposed to look like. And we spend so much time looking like it that we never, ever achieve it. The look comes after the accomplishment, not before. We're so busy looking like it. Now, if you need to do if you need to buy you a suit that you really can't afford to put yourself in a situation where you can do work to build you something and you know that people are going to, you know, judge you on that. And I'm the kind of person that I've seen both sides of that. Where I've stood up and decided, man, I'm me. I'm valuable enough in this market with what I bring to the table that I don't have to 
adhere to these superficial standards of a suit tie and all that. Now, not that I don't clean up nice, not that I can't if I if I decide to do it. It's that when you have the goal, you make the rules. Something that my mentor taught me, he who has the goal makes the rules. And he told me, he says, because you are such a renegade, because you are so anti-establishment, that you're going to have to have something that allows you in. And so he who has the goal makes the rule. And he, what, and, and basically what he was teaching me is if I become valuable enough to people and what I have is what they want and no one can deliver it the way I deliver it, they will change their demand on what they need to see me wear. And I, I saw that early in life. I wasn't out of my 30s yet before I had them just totally shattered that whole you got to have a suit and tie on in the boardroom bullshit. But what are you doing to build that value? How are you mastering yourself? And that's the other thing is when you master yourself, when you conquer the things around you that are hurting you, then you are able to conquer the things that are moving against you. One of the reasons we struggle with white supremacy so, so horribly is because we haven't dealt with ourselves. We haven't dealt with the fact that we are enough in and of ourselves. We haven't dealt with the fact that we don't have to be accepted or liked by anybody else in order to do things. We are having a money problem because we stood up and we literally finance our own demise by the money we spend into the economies of others who don't care for us, who don't value our values, interests, our principles that govern and, and dictate how well we're going to do in life. That's on us. We'll sit up and see a program and it, and, and, and it, can, and it can benefit so many people and we'll say, I wish I had it. And then we're in Louis Vuitton, we're in Gucci, uh, we, we, we're on Facebook bra bragging about uh, the new Maserati, the new Beamer, the new Benz. And don't get me wrong. It's your money. You work for it. Do what you want. But understand that you don't get to ask why we're where we're at when you are a contributing factor to it. If you're out there in, in investing in things that benefit them and don't benefit us, there's some things we need that they have that we don't because we haven't built it. So I'm not saying we don't, we have to be very strategic and I spend, one of the things we don't have is a spending agenda. We don't have any form of an agenda that says this is how we build strategically to grow collective black wealth. This is how we operate internally so that we grow and connect and build things together. Everybody's out there. That's, and I'm gonna tell you something, uh, one of my, Friends, and she is a, a beast in her own right. And I hate using the word beast with such a beautiful queen, but she's a beast in her own right. Latava, Mel, Mel, okay, now, long name, long last name. Uh, but this, she's reared uh, an unbelievable uh, set of children, uh, very strong in her values. But something she said today is an entire generation. No, she said entire generations have fallen through the gap of individualism. And she couldn't be more accurate in that assessment. We've been taught to think about ourselves. So we are abandoning all the values, interests, and principles that made us different, that made us special, that made us powerful, that made us unique, that are the blueprint to us developing and becoming what we need to become. We, we, we got to the point now, that's not my business. We got to the point now, don't say anything to my kids. Got to the point now, I don't care about what's going on with that. I'm going to do what I want to do. This is the I want to do what I want to do generation. Nobody's thinking about how it impacts anybody else. Nobody cares. As long as I get to do what I want to do, how I want to do it, that's what's cool. That's what's up. That's, that, that's it. And we don't see the long-term ramifications of how our children are impacted by it. Nobody's thinking about generations that they may never see born, that may be born after they're gone, but will live in the legacy that they created, the environment that they left behind. And so nobody's sitting up and doing the things that need to be done that have a consideration of the collective in mind. And, and, and it plays out in the home. That's why you have horrible marriage 
breakups and in breakups. That's why you got so many kids being reared in single parent homes. That's why you have a crack in the very foundation of our efforts to build wealth. Why? Marriage is a wealth hack. One of the things that I learned about white people being in, in business in corporate America uh, and dealing with people who are affluent, one of the things I would see is a lot of young cats coming straight out of college and getting these six-figure gigs, and all of them had wives. And I'm like, man, you're 23, 24 years old. What are you doing? And since that's what we're taught, they understand that marriage is a wealth hack. They, they will probably not spend their life with that person, which I don't agree with. Because they didn't choose that person based on building with them. They chose that person because they understood that there were going to be certain things that it allowed them to do. And then they're going to get in their 40s and realize, oh my God, she's getting on my nerves or whatever. And some of them will for the sake of protecting the, 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 the inheritance of their children stay. Now, when you enter into this idea right, saying we're going to build together. Yes, I want to be happy. Yes, I want to enjoy life, but I also have a responsibility to build. And that takes work to be patient and understand that I'm dealing with someone who probably thinks diametrically uh, in, to me in many ways because their brains are built different. There's a reason why that's supposed to be. We are supposed to bring balance to each other, not be cosigners to everything each other thinks or says. And because we have this mindset, oh my God, they're getting on my nerves. Oh my God, this is happening. Oh my God, I can't stand this. And now what we have is a prime example. You think that it's just political or it's just whatever. That's a reason why in the early 70s, they went from having to prove up a divorce. They still use the term prove up, but there's no proving up anymore. When they sit up and say, okay, when you come in and you do your testimony and say why you should have a divorce and all that, it's called proving up. But what you used to have to do is actually prove up. What it meant is you had to prove that your spouse did something that violated the marriage. But what they did in the early 70s, I want to say 1972, is they changed it to irre irreconcilable differences or insupportability. What does that mean? That means that we're just not getting along. And there's no chance of us getting to a point where we get along. Well, of course not. If nothing is there to say you need to try harder. See, it used to be the family. The family said, I said, no, we need to sit down and talk about this. When I wrote... When Your House Is Not a Home, which is my fourth book. And even when I re went back and re revisited some 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 of the uh, old data and uh, in interviewed some more people when I wrote Merging Souls, uh, one of the things I found is in Eastern cultures, the family is more heavily involved in the marriage. It's not considered uh, intrusive. It's considered supportive. They're not there to boss you around, but they're there to hold you accountable. So when somebody does something, the other both 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 families come together united and say what's going on and there's no taking of sides the side that's going to be taken is the right side it doesn't matter who's on it and they're going to demand that you get your butt in there and get it figured out why they understand the importance of holding marriages together they understand that the very value system that they're trying to promote and pass down to their progeny has to go through you and you can't sit up and get caught up in your own individualized mindset and feelings and go run off because you can't have what you want at any particular given time. I'm not saying stay in abusive relationships. I'm not saying stay in some place where you know a person doesn't value you. I'm not talking about being in a situation where you're literally being diminished and torn down. I'm talking about looking at something and saying, I think this person really cares about me. I think this person really loves me and say, you know what? Let's figure out a way to make it work. Let's let's get out of self on both sides. Let's get out of self and build. Why? Because if we can build together, we're going to be in a better position to build wealth. We're going to be in a better position to provide for our progeny. We're going to be in a better position to ensure that our children and their children and their children don't have to go into debt to get an education or to become viable in a an economy. They can earn a living wage by what we provide and support them so they can get a, a living wage skill. Doesn't necessarily mean going to college. That's something else we got to look at. A great deal of black debt is in student loan debt. What we find out is what, what, what skills we were able to obtain and what uh, level of value we put brought into the market wasn't equivalent to the amount of money we spent on the paper that we have on the wall that isn't worth what we spent on it. 
And so you got a bunch of people who have spent $100,000 on the education that a guy that did six months at a plumbing institute or 12 months at an electrical engineering uh, institute is out earning them. Somebody with a high school diploma and a certification and licensing is earning more than more, more most of the uh, bachelor uh, degree people in the workforce. Most of the people who have gotten past their apprenticeship as a plumber, as an electrician, as a contractor, as an auto mechanic, are making six figures. And we need to be able to push our kids in directions that they are also passionate about. Why? If they're passionate about it, they're more likely to go hard in and be invested in it and develop a keen sense of where it is and what they're doing. These are just some of the things that we're not doing. These are some of the things that we're not mastering. These are some of the things that are coming back to harm us and hurt us in this battle to develop socioeconomic progression and in some way develop power. We cannot develop power. We cannot develop a force in which we are autonomous without economic force. We live in a capitalist society where money matters, where you can't get anything done. Unless we're just gonna go completely as a race off the grid, we're gonna have to learn how to master money. We're gonna have to master the money mindset. We're gonna have to master our relationships with money. We're gonna have to start understanding how we do it. It's not what you have on your feet. It's not what you have. I'm not saying don't look nice. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that you've got to bring balance to what you think is important and what really has value versus what does. Nothing wrong with the symbol if you got the reality. But if you got the symbol and without, without the reality, you just wasted a capacity mechanism in getting it. If you spent $2,500 on a bag, $5,000 on some rims, that same $2,500 is capable over the course of time just being put into a um, interest bearing account or, or something that grows compound. So let's say the S&P 500. Go to the internet, plug in, uh, type in uh, compound interest calculator. Plug in the $2,500 for the bag or any other thing that you have wanted or you've seen people spend money on uh, regardless and say, okay, I'm going to plug this in. I say, this is what I'm going to put in a year or however often that kind of money is being spent on stuff it shouldn't be spent on. So I'm going to put that amount in, put it in, and then play with it year by year. In three years, what would it be worth? In four years, what would it be worth? In five years, in 10 years. And you see what you're throwing away on something that's eventually going to sit up in there and it's the, the emotional fulfillment you're going to get off of it will be gone in weeks or maybe months tops. It just becomes another bag after that. It just becomes another car after that. You know, you, you get a little pride when you step out of it, but, you know, that note starting to hit you. And, you, and, and so you can't really feel that great about it because you're worried about how you're going to pay for it and keep it. The down payment you put on that and the money you're spending monthly on that you go out and buy something affordable, buy a nice cash car. You can buy a nice car just like that, but older and get it cash. And guess what? Now you have something that is collateral and insurable. It's an asset. Even though it probably isn't worth what you pay for it totally in cash, but if you, you're, you're a good negotiator and you got the right, you might have got it for less than what it was worth. But one thing is going to be is it's not going to be a, a, an ongoing liability where you're having to spend money on itself if you have to get it fixed or whatever. And you can get a reasonable aftermarket warranty. There's so many different things that we could be doing that will put us in a better position to live in a way that we can grow wealth and we can close that wealth gap and we can climb the socioeconomic ladder. Now, we're not climbing this ladder to prove anything to anybody else. We're climbing this ladder because there are benefits that come with climbing it. There are benefits in ways of putting our, our children and future generations in better positions to be successful and to win in life and not have to endure a bunch of things that we have to endure. That's the whole thing. We're trying to grow. We're trying to hand down something better than what we inherited. And we have a responsibility to do that. That's just a little bit of my answer to that person this morning. And, you know, the, 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 the total conversation was 
off the chain. Uh, but what we're going to have to do is do something better than sit around and finance our own demise. Uh, on that note, I'm getting ready to get, out, get off. Like I said, when this started, we need your support. Go into the description box, click the link. Uh, programs like Black Men Lead uh, is so desperately needed. Our mental health programs are needed more than ever uh, with the rise in suicide and other mental uh, disorders, uh, like uh, other mental disorders and situations. We definitely need that. Uh, being able to provide support for our young women and young girls, uh, intimate partner violence and intimate partner homicide, depression, and so much more. We need your help. Go to the description box, click the link, and give. On that note, look, I'm out of here. I thank you for letting me take your time. You guys have an unbelievable remainder of your day. Thank you.